Dude, should we get into it? Yep, I'm going to unmute myself so I can actually hear myself. There we go. How good's hearing yourself in the cans? You just sound so much more pro, don't you? Now you're showing off because I haven't figured out how to do that. <laughs> how do I do that so I can hear myself? Are you all alone there with a bunch of synthesizers and a bass guitar? Yeah, I'm just alone. I'm Mark Ronson, and this is the Fader Uncovered podcast. In this interview series, I'll be speaking with some of the most influential and groundbreaking musicians in the world, from genre-defining stars to avant-garde trailblazers, about their lives and careers. Each episode will be rooted in these musicians' iconic Fader cover stories, an institution that over the past two decades has told artists stories like no other. The podcast is a chance for us to talk about the past, present, and future, reflecting on their breakthroughs, diving into their lives when their covers hit shelves, and discussing what the future might hold now. And it's an opportunity for me to speak to some of the artists I most admire. This is The Fader Uncovered with Mark Ronson. Today I'm talking to my good friend and a frequent collaborator of mine, Kevin Parker of Tame Impala. Tame Impala graced the cover of the Fader 82 in the fall of 2012, right before dropping their now classic breakthrough record, Lonerism. I first discovered Tame Impala in the summer of 2009 with their very first EP. I was absolutely transfixed from day one. Kevin's bewitching falsetto vocals drenched in reverb, singing these wonderful yet somehow insolent melodies swirly psychedelic guitars and live drums that sounded like they came right off a boom bap hip hop record. They basically combined all of my favorite things in music in a way that no one was doing at that time. Plus, they had song titles like 41 Mosquitoes Flying in Formation, which made you wonder where this dude's head was at. If I was transfixed on EP1, when their debut album Inner Speaker dropped, I was a full-on fan. We were booked to share a festival stage in Australia in 2010, and I remember thinking to myself on the flight to Oz, please don't let these guys be dicks because I like their music too much. Well, they weren't dicks at all. They were lovely dudes, and a friendship and a musical bond evolved from that trip. Kevin brought a ton of grit, groove, and depth to my next album, Uptown Special, even taking a 37-hour trip from Perth to Memphis in the process. That's about seven planes. Sometimes the jet lag was so insane he would curl up and fall asleep in front of the speakers while they were blasting at almost ear-splitting levels. Being close friends with Kevin during this time, I also got a first-hand glimpse of how the world fell for the music of Tame Impala. How they went from being your favorite band's favorite band, see the Arctic Monkeys covering backwards, to your favorite rapper's favorite band, see ASAP Rocky sampling backwards, to just about being everyone's favorite band. They've done everything from headlining Coachella to recently passing the billion stream mark for The Less I Know The Better, a song recorded in a bedroom in Perth that Kevin actually nearly accidentally gave to me one time. I was extremely excited to catch up with Kevin the day after they had just live streamed a performance of their flawless debut album, Inner Speaker, from start to finish. How are you, dude? You good? I'm good. I'm in great pain, actually. What happened? Uh, I, I rolled my ankle this afternoon. Oh, shit. I just didn't put any ice on it. Okay. And now it's really starting to kick in. <laughs> really? <laughs> Can you take some fucking Advil or something? Uh, I think it's too late for that. Okay. It's also giving me a lot of sort of like after school nostalgia. The same time that I went, ow, I went like, I haven't rolled my ankle in years. <laughs> what were you doing? You weren't playing basketball, were you skateboarding? Uh, I was kicking the football. Okay. Kicking the footy. Okay. Classic after school pastime in Australia. It's an um, Australian rules football, which is yeah unfamiliar to anyone outside of Australia. Okay. Um, but it's a pretty exciting game and I recommend. <laughs> well, I appreciate you going through this painful thing to pursue this interview. This is actually helping. Uh, I put it up there with 17-hour flights from Perth to Memphis grimacing through the pain for this interview. Oh, sure. Just to start, how was the moment house? How was the inner speaker live thing? Were you happy with it? Yeah. Yeah, it went off without a hitch in the end. 
like as with all these kinds of things, it ends up just being a whole lot more work than I anticipated. You know, like the idea was I was like, oh, yeah, we're just going to go down to Wave House and we're going to set up and just play through the whole, you know, speaker and get our friends to film it. Like easy, right? That's where you made in a speaker at this house. Yeah, it's the um, ramshackle beach mansion that I uh, that we rented ten years ago, and um, yeah, we've gone back there to um, exhume the spirits of that album. Yeah, and was it still available? Like, I wonder, is that also because you have such crazy fans? It was has that become like a sort of weird like stop on this like Tame Impala mythology tour of Perth or something? I've been told that a lot of people go to take photos there. Yeah. Like in the in the sort of the – it's like the living room. You can kind of see the ocean. Uh, I've been told that a lot of bands go and do photo shoots there. <laughs> really? But no longer because I bought the house last year. Oh, you did? Oh, mm-hmm. congrats. Thanks, man. So I'm sort of embarrassed to say so I bought – my ticket, yeah. like a fan, because even though we're friends and we work together, I am a Tame Impala fan. It's kind of funny to me because, you know, I know guys in bands. I know you. I know Albert from The Strokes. But occasionally I will just get the email because you're like on a fan mailing list. It's like, check out this new T-shirt from Tame Impala. But I saw the thing. Yeah. Buy a ticket to see Tame Impala play their first record. I love that first record. It's one of my first records of all time. Thanks, man. But, of course, I didn't realize that you had to see it at the exact time. I guess that yeah. was the point, right? It's yeah. like to make it like a real concert. So I missed it. Yeah, I think I, oh, <laughs> I think it did. Uh, I think it was confusing for a few people. I mean, like, hey, if 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 I wasn't on the other end, it, it would have been confusing for me too. But yeah, yeah, I mean, like, with all these kind of things, there's sort of different ways of doing it and um, different time zones to take into account. It makes sense, especially in this era of COVID, to make a concert that you have to see at a certain time because then it makes it feel most like a real concert, like you had to go at the thing. But I was just an idiot and I didn't really think about it. Oh, uh, shit. Well, I think it's on YouTube now. Okay. So, okay. Um, yeah. Well, have you done any other things like during, because, you know, you guys are so, you you put out the slow rush. I imagine you're about to go on like the craziest, the biggest tour you've been on and then lockdown corona happens have you done any was that the first thing was that the first show that you guys did uh not really i mean we did a whole bunch of kind of like filmed just sort of like recording ourselves play, playing a song for kind yeah. of like different tv shows we did one for um we did tiny desk in here actually okay um cool. and a few kinds of things like that which were cool I saw too. You did something in Perth. You did um, the Tame Impala like sound system. Well, yeah, yeah. Then that happened. That was cool. Yeah. So tell me about that because obviously you and I have DJ together. You have a huge love for dance music and different ways to bring music live when it's not necessarily just a band. Yeah. Tell me what that was. The evolution. Well, that was kind of like just this idea that I had while we were doing a bunch of these kind of I call them I call them sound system performances where it's kind of you know it's like we're performing the songs but it's all electronic you know it's all sequenced and and samplers it's kind of like it's like it's like living out my kind of fantasy of um performing the songs as though we were like an electronic group you know yeah everything's like all the machines are hooked in it's like it's a satisfying uh, an urge for me basically and we've had a lot of fun DJing as well. Do you play other people's music when you do the Tame Impala sound system gig or you just play Tame Impala? No, we do a couple of like sort of homages. I mix in, um, there's a sample from I Like The Way You Move by Outcast. Okay. Which I kind of like just like bleed into it. Yeah. Um, into, into reality and motion, which actually reminded me a lot of like kind of your approach to DJing. You know, I kind of like, I felt like I was you for a second. Right. Well, whenever I DJ Apocalypse, Dreams, I always pretend I'm you. <laughs> okay. I don't know if you checked out this article or you ever look back. I don't picture you as a guy who like reads old press yet. But, you know, what we're doing is talking about, because it's for the fader, and talking about that cover story from 2012, just before Lonerism came out. Yeah, I just had to read through it, actually. It was kind of a trip. Yeah, I thought it's kind of amazing because that is about, probably just about after when I met you, and I was thinking that Inner Speaker, just to talk about Inner Speaker for a second, that must have sort of 
perform beyond your wildest dreams just as far as the international recognition? Like, I imagine at that point you were like, wow, like, this is it. Like, we've made it. And obviously it was successful in its own way, and, but, you know, where you went after that is next level. But tell me about just that thing coming off that making lonerism. Did you feel pressure? Were you psyched about the success of Inner Speaker? I guess deep down... I was kind of uh, satisfied, you know, fulfilled, let's say. But like my brain always finds a way to to doubt it and get bummed out by it. Like it's funny just reading that article back, I think that must have been just after I'd finished the album. I don't know if it had come out yet, but um, I just remember being really frustrated. <laughs> With the record? Uh, no, just like the record I was probably... Like it was done and I was kind of happy that it was done. It's funny reading myself expressing thoughts that I'm kind of experiencing for the first time, like that kind of pressure. Like yeah. the pressure that I, put up, that I put on myself for lonerism was immense. And I remember when I finished it, I was like, well, it's done. It's not as good as in a speaker, but it's done. You know, Right. If people like, there's this song called Feels Like When You Go Backwards and if people like that song, then I'll be happy, you know. Anyway, yeah, there was kind of just a lot more working out my role and working out it, like just sort of really insignificant interpersonal stuff yeah. that kind of frustrated me, just like how we operated as a band and as a, as a solo thing, obviously. So I think like during that interview, I remember the guy came to Perth for a few days and hung out with us. It was kind of that thing where uh, I was telling the guys, uh, a guy from a magazine, is gonna come and hang out with us for a couple of days. Like I just, I just remember that kind of eye roll. Really, you know, they're just like lame, right? You know, and like they probably weren't even. It was probably just my sort of interpretation of they're like, yeah, cool, Kev, whatever. Yeah, it's actually a really beautifully written article. Like the guy writes about Perth because I've I've been to Perth a bit for shows and come to see you and. There's like a very unique thing about Perth. It is this feeling of this town that's literally the most remote city in the world as far as it's the furthest mm. from another city mm -hmm. but yet there is like there's there's money there's culture there's these things but it's also a small town he keeps saying it's a small town trying to be a big city and the way he talks even about it is like this really beautiful like how like graham green and these like english authors write about like the middle class and like the 50s and shit yeah but what did you think about the way did you think he got Perth, right? I mean, that is kind of um, not to discredit the article or him in any way, but like that is kind of a narrative that I think people like to push, especially in the context of me. Right. Like come to Perth and they're like, oh, what's this like isolated big country town trying to be a big city? Right. And some, and like they try to sort of pair it with me as being an isolated artist, um, the music sounding isolated. Uh, so that is a thing. And like for someone from Perth reading it, it can be a bit kind of like, yeah, you kind of cringe a bit. But, but, but like, here's the thing as I was reading it just then, the more he sort of spoke about it, I was like, God damn, he's right. <laughs> right. <laughs> you know? Was he talks about canyons a bit, but was there a scene in Perth before you? Like, was there anyone that you could look to? Was there like a godfather, like somebody who like gave you an old drum machine or some shit? Or did you really just kind of pull it together yourself and with Jay and or whoever else your like peers were at that time? Yeah, I mean, as far as I'm concerned, the scene I was involved with was about 10 people. Yeah. Six of whom lived together, you know? Yeah. Yeah, like uh, there was definitely a Perth scene, like a really strong scene, arguably more than there is now. It was really kind of thriving. Like we'd play so like th three, four nights a week, well, maybe three nights a week. But, you know, like I, I think we always kind of felt like we were a bit removed from that. Like we kind of just did our own thing. Yeah. But, but it meant that there were like opportunities to play. Yeah. All the time. I remember when we met on that Future Music Tour and I was already a big fan of Inner Speaker and I came over and I was kind of like, oh, I was going to play on this festival and it was you, me, MGMT. Mm -hmm. And then... Uh, Dizzy Rascal. Dizzy Rascal and Kesha on the main stage. Big yeah. artists, big guys on the main stage. Yeah. And then there was like the little, you know, indie stage. I don't know how the fuck I ended up on an indie stage, but yeah, it was you, 
then us, then MGMT. Now that order would be completely flipped around. But I thought, oh man, I'm going all the way over to Australia. I've never been over there before. I'm going to meet these guys whose music I love, who I know nothing about. Like, I just kind of hope they're not dickheads. There's nothing worse. Like, I don't want to like meet these guys and then it's like ruins the music. And the first thing I meet is like Jay bounding around like on a golf cart backstage. He's like, mate, yeah, oh, oh so good to meet you. Like, da, 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 you got to come say hi to Kevin. I was like, oh man, these guys are just like so lovely. But I, I remember that tour and I think at the very end, you play me some demos, but I was so wasted. Mm -hmm. You play me some demos. I remember thinking like, oh man, I'm privy. I'm hearing like the next record. You must have played me like some of the things of Lonerism, but I just yeah. always hate the fact that I was so wasted that night that I don't remember anything that you played. Well, man, I remember that night. I was, I felt insanely privy because I was in Mark Brunson's hotel room. Oh shit. At like four in the morning, you know, right. with a bunch of other people. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, that was great. That was a great night. It was kind of cool, though, because I felt like you felt like finally like you trusted me enough or something. You're like, you know what? I, I'm going to get the fucking hard drive out. And then <laughs> Lonerism came out, and I fucking loved it. I feel like the evolution, because you're my friend, I don't want to like talk about all these tropes about you and the isolated music and you're like coming out as a person, but I do feel like the albums actually do that. Like Inner Speaker, I think of like, lyrics of solitude is bliss and stuff it's such an insular record it's like a headphone record and you're really by yourself having these thoughts when you're listening to it lonerism it's the same thing but it's like a little more joyous and like the way the album opens almost with a mantra and then you have the big apocalypse dreams which is like pretty euphoric but i still was like very much by myself with that record too like i loved it i remember mm -hmm. walking on the beach in vietnam it's so fucking random but listening to the record over and over again is lonerism even more were you even more isolated making that record than you were with inner speaker uh yeah yeah because with that album i'd kind of finally discovered the confidence to go all right fuck you guys this is how i'm doing it because I'm going to do it, you know, like yeah. leading up to then I was kind of like doing it the way that I felt that I should do it, like, you know, how it would look on the outside kind of thing. Um, yeah. Instead uh, of, you know, wanting to be inclusive and wanting to um, tick boxes. But lonerism, I was kind of like, you know, I'd kind of like gotten closer to finding myself as an artist. And so I had these kind of grandiose ideas and had the confidence to go through with them, you know. So like... Lonerism, at that point, I kind of saw it as my, you know, pet sounds or, or, or whatever, you know. You said that you knew that you had one song, Feels Like We Only Go Backwards. So, And obviously that was such a festival smash and that is like a really big moment in the set when you play it and Arctic Monkeys have covered it and whatever else. Mm -hmm. But did you know that you had an idea by making the record? You're like, okay, this is a jam. I got this no matter what. Yeah, I think it's more of a case of like by the time you finish an album, all the kind of like production and everything boils away and that stuff doesn't really impress you, you know, like like amazing song structures or chord changes or whatever. So the things you end up liking the most are just the simplest. Yeah. That song is kind of one of the only songs I've written where I've loved it from the start to the finish, you know, like where I've not sort of doubted it. Yeah. In any way. What about Elephant, dude? Come on. Elephant, you must have known. You've been like, I got this riff and it's going to kill Glastonbury. Uh, <laughs> finally, I know it. <laughs> that song almost didn't make it on the album. Okay. I kind of tacked it on because I thought that the album was too wishy-washy without us. Like, it needs a strong rock moment. Yeah. I kind of made it with that. Well, I already had the riff actually from a few years ago and the kind of the, the, the motif. Yeah. I guess the strength of that song, Elephant, is that I wasn't precious about it. Yeah. I was kind of making this like comically glam rock, you know. I didn't feel the need to like fit it into the template of the rest of the album. There's all these great stories about like the whole record's done and then the last minute they're like, oh, no, yeah, but we yeah, need yeah, one more yeah, thing exactly. like that. There's like Sabotage by the Beastie Boys. Yeah. It's always like a dumb rock Paranoid. number too, right? Which one? Um, Paranoid by Black Sabbath. 
There's like all those stories. It's kind of cool. Like totally. you just like when you just don't give a fuck and you just go in and you're like, bow, bow, dun, 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 dun. that's it. It's a really powerful freedom of mind, isn't it? One of the things that always attracted me to in a speaker, and we talked about it, is the drums. And we both have the same kind of like obsession with drums and the sounds of breaks and that's what ties your music to hip-hop and obviously through the years is why hip-hop has been drawn to your music i guess feels like we only go backwards it seems like to me really stands out it's like oh that's when you had the confidence to do a slow tempo cool fucking song the same way that brand new person like yeah. and it's just like for me i'm always thinking like a dj you got to speed it up you got to speed it up and like you just started this whole new sound and this wave of like just no shit can be like 75 beats per minute bob your head and people are gonna love this <laughs> shit anyway and it just has this kind of like just this feel and that's that was like the first shit when like didn't asap rocky sample feels like we only go backwards and like it there were all these things happening yeah i think so for like a random kind of off cut thing i think yeah that that song was the first of a lot of songs for that with that kind of groove for me yeah were you listening to anything while you were making lonerism or were you always just when you're making a record are you just completely shut out the outside world like print style and you're just only about what you're working on yeah i guess like probably the the latter definitely leading up to sort of like getting really into the album i'm kind of like allowing things to come in but yeah i'm one of those artists that by the time i'm kind of deep in it other music is kind of just nails on the blackboard, you know. Either that or the opposite. It's so gorgeous and fresh and unfamiliar that it sounds better than what I'm working on, so I yeah. can't stand it. Makes me depressed, basically. I've always been admiring, even envious, of people who can craft a classic by themselves from start to finish. You think of Sly and there's a riot going on. Any Prince album... Stevie, etc. There are those who can do it all. They write the song, play the song, arrange and produce it perfectly. There's a feeling of this sign on the studio door that probably says, genius at work, do not enter. But the flip side of that, I imagine, is that it's also a very lonely place to be. You're always by yourself. You have to rely on your own and only your own creative instincts at all times, which can be especially maddening at times of creative insecurity. Plus, there's also no one to high-five when you play a hot bass lick. When I think of my own favorite moments in the studio, it's finding that perfect chord on a guitar and watching Lady Gaga's face light up as she spurts out some golden melody. It's Jeff Basker playing some insane synth line that makes me and Bruno look at each other in amazement. It's those moments of shared euphoria. That's what I live for. But I also adore the introverted music of Tame Impala, and I realized that the insecurities that nearly pushed him to the brink of sanity while making Lonerism, I mean, that album is so good because of the intense isolation of its creator. So Lonerism comes out, and obviously it's not this huge failure. In fact, it takes you up to the next level. When that shit came out, and you're touring, and it must have felt pretty good to be, okay, cool, like, it's not over, I didn't fuck it up. <laughs> I mean, I, like, I'd wish, I, I wish I could say yes, like, yeah, and that's when it felt good. That's when I was like, right, you know, right. like, I wish, I wish I had that moment. But I don't know. Yeah. Put it this way, like, only sort of recently, the last album, I've – forced myself to appreciate the good things that happened with it you know because i'm just like this one i was like just like fuck it fuck it i'm gonna like enjoy it this time because every album that i've done has been good it has been a success but i haven't enjoyed it yeah i haven't enjoyed releasing it i haven't enjoyed like the idea of people listening to it i haven't enjoyed playing it live until years after by which point it's kind of like too late you know so it's only kind of recently where i've just made a packed with myself to enjoy it and um appreciate it and what about like i think of all those amazing shows like i was at that show during lonerism at brixton academy and it's like the real anointing of a new rock 
God arriving when you're like look backstage and it's like Kate Moss and da da da. Like it would really was the fucking like the storybook oh, yeah. cliche thing of like you're backstage and it was like the kills and the Arctic Monkeys and like everyone's just like high five and everyone's just standing with like enwrapped adoration like through the whole show. Like those things still like you'd come off stage and there wasn't any kind of validation from that stuff either. Uh, <laughs> I had a huge fight with my girlfriend that night. <laughs> okay. <laughs> but no, th- there were a lot of good times. There were a lot of good times, like backstage and meeting some of my idols. Yeah. Yeah, there, there were great times, and I uh, yeah, found some way to enjoy them. I mean, we all have the same anxieties and neuroses and things that like don't let us enjoy records, and as yeah. they're coming out or successes, yeah. it's happening. Of course, that's a very human thing, but I have a theory... You come off the stage and you've had the best gig that you've ever had and you think it was the worst ever. And I think that the adrenaline rush of when you go on stage and all those things, when it's completely depleted when you come off, your brain confuses that adrenaline crash. Mm -hmm. So it is a genuine depression. Mm -hmm. So your first thought is to go to, that was a terrible show. And then you come off stage and then... Somebody high fives you and then a few more people say that didn't suck. But then you just get so wasted to carry this sort of high and then obliterate any of the thoughts of like, by the time you're doing your like sixth line in the bathroom and your fifth <laughs> beer, you're like, no, it's the fucking best show, right? Like, I, there's like yeah. a weird... Yeah, totally. Yeah. The, the crash, the crash of uh, anticipation and, and energy and yeah, 100%. And then that night is really etched in my brain. I don't know if you remember this, but... There was some house party after after party in East London after that. And, you know, we had always talked about maybe making some music together, but it was the end of the night. Like, I just remember sitting down next to you and you were like, yo, if we do some music, we should like put it down for like the funk. And I remember you said the word <laughs> funk and I was like, I mean, I love funk. My first love was the meters, all these kinds of music. But to me, like funk had become a word like, hijacked by like sure. jam bands and like sure. you know all respect to the chili peppers i love them but like that's what funk had become I, I remember that exact conversation do you remember it do you remember saying i uh, it's one of those weird things where like i, I have no reason to remember it because i don't know what time in the morning it was i was like hey mark what about if we did like funk music i remember you said you had me at what about <laughs> oh yeah yeah because i just wanted to make music with you anyway You said something like, yeah, because nobody's like really putting it down for like just like straight funk. And I kind of know what you meant, like just grooves for the sake of grooves, like do some good shit, get some good drum sounds, give it a killer bass line. And we started to jam and then we worked a lot on my Uptown special record. You helped out and contributed so much to that. And that was the album with Uptown Funk. And there's a weird correlation, even though you didn't work on that song, between you saying that, because I think that I never would have thought that the word funk was okay to like use in a song if there wasn't some moment at that after party where you're like said funk and i was like if kevin says the word funk like maybe it's cool again like who the fuck knows and i remember when uh and then we did That's interesting do some extremely funky shit daffodils was an incredible song that you had like the whole groove and bass line you you brought some serious funk i remember q-tip being like you should put that out as a single man not that out town funk shit i remember like that was q-tip's fucking jam was uh daffodils but um the groove is so fucking heavy in the music do you start sometimes with the bass line with the drums or is that like how does that start with the songs on on something like currents and lonerism it's pretty rare that i'll start with a drum beat and then just sort of try and see where it goes. Like, as you know from kind of working with me, I, I like I like there to be a kind of like a spark. Yeah. You know, that came from somewhere else other than the desire to make a cool beat. Yeah. Or a cool bass line. Like, they just sort of like, rather than like wanting to do it, it wanted you to do it you know yeah definitely is that a lyric sometimes or is that just like an accidental like uh you play a chord that you never heard before and you're like oh and then you're sort of off to the races or how do those sparks come to you i call it like flicking on the radio mm-hmm. you know like sometimes when i walk out of a room there's lots of noise lots of people and going from a loud place to a quiet place really quickly i feel like my brain 
needs a way to sort of like transition it. And so I kind of just like just music starts playing in my head. Or more broadly, like any time I'm kind of just tense or nervous or anything. Like tension for me creates music. I think I, think I probably started doing it uh, when I was a kid, like really young. If there was like a tense, you know, situation or environment around me, I kind of like just sort of play music in my head, you know. Really? That's yeah. fucking cool. Oh, well, yeah. that's kind of kind of what I've traced it back to, I think. Yeah. I would have this crazy thing when I'd have tense moments as a kid. I would actually hallucinate orally, like A-U-R-A-L-L-Y. Wow. Yeah. And if I would turn on the radio, it would sound like the weatherman was yelling at me. Like wow. I knew somehow it wasn't, but it would turn out it was like, it was 76 degrees in Manhattan today. Wow. And like quite scary and like yelling. Yeah. And I couldn't break it until like I'd go and, I'd have to go wake up my mom. Yeah. Like, I'd try and call a friend, and it would sound like the same shit. Same. It's crazy how our brain does that. Yeah. I feel like that's for another episode. <laughs> it's The Mind with Mark Ronson. Yeah. Do you, uh, do you remember any specific highlights off of the lonerism, like just the tour and that record being out? And I'm sure there were some awards and stuff like that that came with it. Uh, weirdly, I think Coachella was really fun. Well, I mean, not weirdly. Like, well, I guess weirdly, only because Coachella isn't always fun, as as everyone who's played Coachella knows. You know, they call the Coachella curse. Is it really? No, I don't know. I th- I played it once in like two thousand eight, but what is it? Just that it's always kind of like a gig that you you're so excited to be playing, and then it just kind of fucks up. Oh, everything. You know, I think there's so much anticipation from you, the artist, and you know your record label. Everyone wants you to have that perfect Coachella show. Yeah. Because it like it, it exists in their imagination somewhere. Yeah. You know, like has it, obviously I mean I guess like people like Beyonce, Daft Punk have had that show. Yeah. Where it's like game changing. But the pressure on artists to deliver that. Like I think Billie Eilish kind of experienced that. I watched a documentary the other day and it's kinda of like everyone wanted her to have that perfect show. Yeah. So it's so they call it the Coachella Cross. It, ne- it never works out, you know. It's always like really? you get bummed out and oh yeah, the crowd is always uh, like a quarter into it. I went to the Billie Eilish show and I didn't really know much about it. I thought it was amazing. I was like, there's fucking eighty thousand people here, yeah. like jumping up and down, pogoing. But that's also that thing, right? Like you just everybody else is having the best time and you think it's a shitty show. It just it completely depends on your fucking brain chemistry on that day. Yeah. And then that was the same year that you guys headlined, right? Yeah, uh, yeah, that's it. We headlined a bit later. The year we played Coachella after Lonerism, like I didn't even really care that it was Coachella. I still hadn't even really sort of cottoned on to what Coachella was and what it meant to people and that kind of scene, you know. And so we just played a gig like any other and it was really amazing. Tyler, the creator, was watching. It blew my mind. Tyler, the creator, and Danny DeVito were both watching. <laughs> really? Yeah. That's fucking cool. It was. It was that was a great day. Were you playing that perfect sundown set? Yeah. Like the the storied five PM. I think I can picture a press shot from that gig with like the palm trees and like that's the best time to play when you're like the band on the way up. Totally. Totally. That's the yeah, that's the time to do Coachella. Not headlining. Everyone's yeah. cooked by the time the headliner comes on. David Hasselhoff watched our Coachella set, our one Coachella set in 2008. <laughs> I remember it. There's like a theme. I guess because it's near LA, you get like just wild celebrities like that you wouldn't get at other festivals or something, right? Yeah. It's, it's just, it's just it. like LA. That's it. Fucking LA. And then did you enjoy your headline set? I thought that was incredible. The fucking lights and the laser show. I thought you really, it showed that you were like, okay, we want to really deliver that shit that like everyone will have to talk about yeah. for the next. Yeah, I think it was just a concerted effort to just let's just blow the budget. Well, no, let's spend the budget. The budget was to spend significantly less than what we were getting paid, which we didn't. We spent everything of what we got paid. And so that was that. But, you know, it was cool, you know, like we bought the ticket, we rode the rode the ride, you know. Yeah. <laughs> you know, like it was like, all right, we're getting we're getting like three mil or whatever for Coachella, let's just spend it all. But well, we were like, let's spend it all. We just ended up spending it all. (laughs) 
I've seen Tame Impala play countless times, and I've probably seen most of their Glastonbury and Coachella performances. I've seen them slowly move up the bill over the course of 10 years till they headline the fuckers. And it really is amazing to watch a band you love do it the right way, I guess, the old school way, just by continually proving yourself, putting out amazing music and winning more and more people over. And for whatever Instagram floral crown parade Coachella has become, to get that headline slot on the poster is still a big deal, even if just superficially. I know I was even psyched for them when I saw that poster the first time. And don't let Kevin's low-key demeanor fool you. He knew he had to kill it. From the insane spaceship laser lighting scheme that gave Daft Punk a run for its money, to the ASAP Rocky guest verse, I'm sure they could have killed it without all those things, but Kevin realized the gargantuanness of headlining that festival. But I also remember going backstage after the show, and it was pizza and beer and just another show in the can, dude. What'd you think? So are you going to still tour the slow rush? The world's starting to open back up. Even in Australia and New Zealand, I guess, like they've had like all the restrictions loosened. Are you going to be able to go and start doing some shows for this tour already? I think so. I think it's going to happen. I mean, our first shows are in America. I guess it's kind of been the case of, you know, we've been sort of like booking shows the whole time and then just sort of postponing them or canceling them or whatever because it's obviously not going to happen. But I think these ones might actually just happen. When are they for? I think it's, uh, well, we've got Bonnaroo. Okay. Bonnaroo's going to happen, which is crazy to think that it's going to happen, which is like September. You were like a lot of people's last concert that I've spoken to because you played the forum on what, like March 13th or something? Yeah. Some shit like that. And like even uh, Jimmy Jam, fucking legend, Jimmy Jam and Terry Lewis, you know, did all the incredible Janet Jackson and uh -huh. SOS oh, yeah, yeah, so yeah, much shit. That was his last show. A lot of other people I spoke to. Yeah. And then I saw you March 9th, just before you did San Diego. Yeah. I remember flying the next day and being like, should I wear a mask? Like, there's this weird thing going on. Mm -hmm. I don't know. I like. I remember buying some blankets in a, in a mall. Like, maybe I'll just bring my own blankets on the plane. No one knew what the fuck was going on. <laughs> that was so fucking wild. Yeah, I remember. That's it, man. That's, man, that's so weird. That was like four days before we played our last show, and then we had to cancel the tour. I remember <laughs> I saw you open a door with your T-shirt like with your hat, with it, and I was like, why is, man, Mark's really like worried about this whole coronavirus thing. What's the deal? And then like four days later, the world shut down, you know. Yeah. Like that's, that's how quick it happened. Yeah. But uh, yeah, I mean, the LA shows were great. That was kind of, they were part of my renewed enjoyment in playing live and like releasing music and playing it live the first time. I was like, fuck it, I'm going to enjoy playing one more year. Yeah. And singing the lyrics to these people, you know. Fuck yeah. I saw like uh, an Instagram comment like a week later or whatever, you know, the coronavirus was happening. <laughs> and the caption was like, man, doing stuff really went out with a bang. <laughs> right. <laughs> oh, that was amazing. And One More Year has even more poignancy, right? Because it was just like a whole year got put on hold as well. Yeah, that's, I mean, that's, it's freaky. It's freaky thinking about those lyrics now obviously like I, I kind of had something else in mind but the way they kind of just line up with yeah um, talking about instagram social media posts once a month someone just writes release the tame impala scissor song obviously you and i worked on a song way way back before control even came out yeah with scissor and it was kind of wild and yeah she came into the studio and we thought she was just maybe coming to like write a song. And then she was just so amazing and did this song together. You had the beat. And then uh, she just was like, oh, do you mind if I listen to my, my album that's about to come out? It just came from mastering. And we just sat there for like 53 minutes like w this person's about to be like yeah. the biggest pro yeah. star on the planet totally Ken like Kendrick featured track three I was yeah. like uh, oh so, uh, so uh, obviously that was kind of cool to see have you been in touch with Scissor or like do you have any plans to release that song or anything uh, yes nice yes it's looking good that's exciting yeah it was you that told me like don't worry about the kind of uh trio 
producer, yeah. uh, singer, artist. Yeah. Sort of like arrangement we're going to have. Why don't you just kind of do it? I don't know. Maybe this is old top secret. But um, yeah, I kind of just stumbled across that song the other day. Again, like I was just going through old sessions and I was like, fuck. She's you so know? good on it. She's the- just so fucking amazing. That beat. I remember you and me working in Vox and I left early and you like sent me this voice and you're like, I just started on this thing. And like, I was like, oh, that shit's fucking tasty. Yeah. I just remember she went in and did these uh, just ad libs, like spoken word ad libs. And I remember we were just mesmerized by kind of what she was conjuring up on the fly. It just, it was so evocative and kind of amazing. I've kind of never, you know, like everyone has that studio story of something that happened on the fly, something that happened spontaneously. Yeah. And they were like, man, everyone in the studio was on their mouth, their jaws were on the floor, you know, like I feel like that was my, yeah, that's my, that was, that was my studio moment like that. Yeah. And have you been producing any stuff? I know you keep stuff kind of like close to the chest so we don't have to talk about anything that you don't want to, but obviously you've come up with this really, really not so prolific, but like every single thing that you do as a sort of outside producer or writer is like, it's pretty special. So have you been doing that a little bit more? Like obviously you work with Travis Scott, helped me out on a lot of my records, is the Gaga stuff, the Ju. Have you been working on any stuff like that during the during the lockdown? Not as much as I want. I mean, like weirdly with the whole lockdown year, I've never been busier, but it was just with different stuff, like the sound system performances and then, yeah, and then recently the Inner Speaker 10-year thing. I just haven't really like given myself time and dedication to just producing and songwriting which is what I want to do lots of uh in, in in the coming months you know I think most people really look back on this period and feel like they didn't do enough or like oh this was this time I should have done this and I had all this time or what but like totally it was fucking weird and I don't know if I mean you're a little bit more of an island when it comes to making music but I miss being in a room with people like I'm just sitting here by myself like all day like I don't know if I'm gonna really get to the hot fire we kind of glossed over it in the beginning but revisiting in a speaker with that much detail to really have to like recreate the entire thing live were you kind of like these songs like looking back on them they're almost like young kids like kind of underdeveloped or like all right i see i wasn't quite there yet but this one's good like did you was there like an affinity for inner speaker while you were doing that uh, yeah totally it was a trip it was kind of more of a trip than I expected just kind of like relearning some of the chords that I haven't thought about in 10 years because of their songs that we didn't decide to do live and then it was really kind of quite emotional and um, fulfilling you know just to sort of go over old ground like that and then then like put it all together at the same time the first run through we did we got to the end, like last note, bring, and I was kind of like, wow, that's it, you know? Because you never really think about your albums so intimately from start to finish after you finish them. You know, you sort of like piece them together. Yeah. One song that's sort of halfway through the album might get finished months before the first song or whatever. You know, you never sort of like have to think about it start to finish unless you're listening to it, but that's just listening to it. Yeah. Like actually relearning all the chords and lyrics and singing every lyric from start to finish was kind of like wow that's it that was kind of like more than a year of my life like yeah a kind of like just a time of my life of a snapshot of who I was so that kind of hit me just as we finished the first run through so it was really special there were like some old videos that you're putting up around that time when you were originally making Inner Speaker and that whole story around Jeremy Storm yeah and there was like this crazy storm. And I guess because it really looks like a cabin on the edge of the earth, it's even more like, holy shit, if some storm comes in, it's like this shit's going to get totally blown away. But totally, that was, uh, I highly recommend going and watching that. And was it the same personnel who played on? But did you play everything on Inner Speaker, no? Pretty much, yeah. Jay played drums on a couple of songs. And then there's one song we all we played as a three piece. We just recorded it live. Yeah, I was determined to put one song on when we played as a band. 
but the rest is just me. Yeah, and recorded on a digital A track. You told me once that blew my fucking mind. Yeah, digital A track. Well, sixteen track actually. It's funny, like that album sounds different. To the, well, it's, the structures are different to the rest of my albums because I didn't write those songs kind of as a electronic producer. Like I think from Lonerism onwards, I was a producer making music instead of like piecing together music. But within a speaker, I had no choice. I just had to write the songs from start to finish on my guitar, kind of like sketch out a demo, and then before I start to record the, the real song, I had to just work out how it was all going to happen and play, play through the whole song. And then sort of like stop the guitar, put it down, go and pick up the drums and record over the top of that, like start to finish, and then everything else that's in it, overdubbing guitars. And... Stevie Wonder shit, man. Well, I mean, Stevie Wonder did the drums first. I've never done that. Stevie Wonder okay. would just like write the song had the song in his head and just go and play drums and just play the whole song with nothing else in it. Because he just laid down the drums first, you know, and then put all the instruments over that. And apparently he did weird stuff like he would just, he'd sing the harmonies, sing the harmony like backing vocals before he'd go down and lay, lay down the lead one, you know? Just weird shit like that. Um, I got engaged last weekend. Whoa! And, uh, shit. And... And uh, I remember our first kiss was just an uh, inner speaker was playing in the background. We got <laughs> home. We went to dinner. Congrats, man. Congrats on inner speaker playing in the background. No, I'm just joking. Yeah. Congrats. Yeah, there's a, there's a plaque for that somewhere. There's a, <laughs> a first a very corny Hallmark first kiss plaque. But no, it was, it was forever. It will be etched. It's, it's still my record. Like if I'm like, I really don't know what to listen to. It's just like fucking pull that shit out. Oh, wow, man. Thanks. It's it's weird talking to you, my friend, and I'm like trying to be respectful of the things that like I know that like we don't want to talk about either, but <laughs> that's okay. Thinking about that era, lonerism, that fader cover. Did you know what the fader was? Yeah, I would have heard of it, definitely. Yeah. Um but I, mean, it, I, I, I I hadn't heard of it a lot back then. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I guess it was kind of a bit was it a big deal like American magazine cover? Oh no, I cared. Definitely. Oh, I'm just starting to remember. Uh, that whole kind of week, you know, not that it was like particularly traumatic or anything, but um, you know what, that was an exciting time. I was frustrated with who I was, but it was an exciting time. We just flown Julian over from France, rehearsed with us. Yeah. So Julian, um, he's our drummer. I uh, met him in a bar in Paris, and I said, "Hey, do you want to play drums for us?" <laughs> And he flew over from Perth. His first time in Fremantle. Bless him. He, you know, must have just been like, "What am I doing here?" You know. Yeah. <laughs> he, the first morning he woke up, we have magpies. There's, there are magpies in the rest of the world, right? Yeah, but in England they call it a magpie. Yeah, it's almost like a pigeon of the sea. <laughs> it's just like a, a a nasty loud bird that kind of just eats anything. Yeah, they make kind of weird noises in Australia anyway. And he woke up and he like. There was one outside his window and he thought it was me like just playing on a synthesizer. Because the magpie sounds like a, a synth. It does. It, I mean, I, n I never really thought of it like that, but they do make kind of just weird all over the place noises. Yeah. Oscillating kind of sounds. But yeah, that was a, that was a really different time. Word. Um, got my Model D. Remake. I've been staring at it the whole time. It's great. I, I, I imagine you have a Moog Model D in the, uh, in the studio. I do. I've got one of the reissues. I haven't Me played too. it in a while. Oh, that's a reissue. Yeah, cool. Yeah. Got the, the Prophet 5 up there. I also like the fact that you always take these synthesizers that like should be like not necessarily cool. It's not like the oldest thing. Like You could repurpose like a brand new whatever, Korg, a uh, something that like uh, that I would see in it and go like oh you're not supposed to use that and just like turn it into some like amazing shit and then and then I have to go and buy it because I'm like oh what was that thing that you used on current but uh yeah <sighs> yeah I, I mean that's kind of just one of the things I love doing is like finding something that no one cares about yeah and exploiting its uniqueness um, which is kind of like, uh, to be honest, I've kind of stopped using my Mini Moog. I don't even know where it is. I got it because it was that classic bass synth. 
Yeah. Like it's that bass synth sound. And I started using it and I was like, oh yeah, it's that it's that sound. Yeah. You know? Yeah. So the the, I know the, the reason mean. I stopped using it was the reason I got it in the first place. Cool. Alright, dude. I think uh should we call it what time is it over there? It's uh ten past ten at night. Okay. Bye fader. There you have it, Late Nights, Magpies, and Mini Moogs. I really want to thank my good friend Kevin for sharing so much about his process, life, all of it, making music. He does usually keep it quite close to the chest, so I do appreciate him sharing all that with all of us. Take me out with the fader. Thanks again to Kevin Parker of Tame Impala for taking the time to talk with us. A special fader thank you to our Grammy and Oscar award-winning host, Mark Ronson. Please visit thefader.com slash podcast to read the original cover story and check out a playlist of artists mentioned in this episode. If you like the show, please share it and review us on your favorite podcast app. Join us next Monday to find out which of your favorite artists will be uncovered next. Executive producers Rob Stone and John Cohen. Directed by Daniel Nevetta and produced by The Fader in association with BYT.NYC. Engineered and mixed by David Rogers Berry. Theme music by DJ Premier. For Fader Uncovered merchandise, please visit shop.thefader.com. Thanks, and see you next week.